Welcome back to the Drummer Mindset Podcast. I'm Joel Pereer. Uh, today, I get to release my conversation with Bill Berg. Uh, he's a jazz and fusion drummer known for his work with Flynn and the BBs, Wayne Johnson, and also the drummer that recorded Bob Dylan's album, Blood on the Tracks. Uh, you can catch him playing at various venues in Western Carolina. Uh, we sat down a few weeks ago, and he shares his stories and wisdom on the art of drumming and career that spans over several decades. Uh, but it was a real honor, and I hope you enjoy. All right, Bill. Man, this is different for me, kind of coming into a studio. This place is nice. I've used it uh, a bunch of times with all kinds of different groups, from larger groups, pre-CD, you know, like the, the last rehearsal before going, to, going into the, another studio. So I always recommend for, for uh, bands that have not been in a real studio, uh -huh. come on to a rehearsal studio, and he can actually tape. He's got a little garage band set up in his, uh, on his computer, so people can really hear what they sound like before they start spending the big bucks. Yeah, yeah, smart because it's affordable too. So we're at, I'll just go ahead and say yeah. we're at Crush yeah. Leaf Studios. Sure. Uh, and I guess this is Transylvania County. So Brevard, is that the address then? Uh, I think that's the one he uses. Okay. Could be Mills River up the road a little yeah. bit, but I think I think it's. But very affordable and it's <coughs> treated, and it the lighting in here is great and it feels good in here. And it, it like you can get a you can get a full band in here. Steep Canyon Rangers, uh -huh. my friends. Yeah, this is their room. I yeah. think they rehearse here. I just got their new CD. Haven't listened to it yet, but. Uh -huh. uh, well, why don't you tell me a little bit about your like your beginnings in drumming? Started really early, about five six years old. My dad was a jazz piano player mm -hmm. and singer, so I was hearing the old Count Basie. Uh, Harry James, Benny Goodman, uh, Woody Herman, all those bands of the 40s, 50s, 60s. Wow, okay. He had those records playing all the time, so there was your entrance for me. That's awesome. Uh, one of the first things I do remember and do remember loving were the marches of John Philip Sousa uh -huh. and the piccolo parts in certain parts of the tunes and the snare drum yeah uh cadence stuff yeah. just pulled me in i There's just something thought, about a flute drum combination it's like just motivating right yep, <laughs> yep yep and from there um he noticed i was um getting you know like waste paper containers flipping them over mm -hmm. and my mother's br uh, bread butter spreaders that you spread butter on the br on the freshly baked bread right right those were my brushes yeah. and little tiny, you know, miniature drumsticks. And, uh, and then just keep, I kept growing and my dad knew right away, okay, we need to get him, you know, a set of drums. Yeah. And the first set was like the $65 set with a 26 inch bass drum, uh -huh. which I could actually hide behind. It was so <laughs> tall. It right. was big and a, a funky hi-hat and that, but I just loved it because it was like closest to a real drum set. So, yeah. Uh, and from there I worked those out and got a set of nice Ludwigs, um, saved up for them, had my summer, uh, grass cutting jobs, you know, buck an hour kind of thing, worked all summer to save money. And, uh, and then finally got a nice set of, of sky blue pearl, Oh, Ludwig's yeah. and um, beautiful. Yeah. So then not long after that, uh, I was just good enough to get some calls from rock bands in the area and got in a couple of rock bands. And what age was that? I was about um, 12, 13 oh, okay. in there. So just turning into a teen. And these were adults that were needing a drummer. Actually, not much older than me, okay, gotcha. actually. Yeah, so they were like seniors in high school kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Still, you were hanging out with the older kids, though. I was. Yep. I was. And this was in Minnesota, right? Northern Minnesota, yes. Okay. How far from Minneapolis? 200 miles. Okay. So many times, like I'm, I've been talking to a lot of drummers these days in, j in the jazz scene, too, and so many of them have said, you know, I never really started listening to jazz and until I started playing it. Mm -hmm. And that was my experience. But for you, dad was a jazz piano player. It was always around. 
It was around, and uh, even at that time, though, there were roadblocks, like the principal of the high school thought the jazz music was music of of the bars, you know. Yeah. You were in a less than uh, wholesome uh, environment when you're out playing in a, in a club. Right. You know, so we had to sort of hide that away. The band director, actually a trumpet player, put a little combo together, and we'd still play for events, so we had a little four or five piece combo so i was actually getting to play yeah. some jazz and along with the rock which was good it was rounding out my experience of playing straight eighth rock you know right. or shuffle rock or blues kind of things and then the jazz thing which was a, a different animal but but related you yeah know? yeah absolutely yeah awesome okay so then started playing in rock bands when you were like 12 13 mm -hmm. continued this combo and then what was like, what, what about after school? I had the feeling that I needed a backup plan, and I happened to be an artist, yeah. too. I love drawing. I love painting. Mm. So making that decision, um, I said, I'm going to art school and still playing music. It's so interesting when art is your backup plan. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so I went to Chicago. Uh-huh and went to a two-year school studying illustration and design uh -huh. and drawing. Uh -huh. But I still had my, I brought my Ludwigs into this tiny little apartment room, had uh, towels and blankets on them so they wouldn't make noise. Mm -hmm. But I always had that going. I'd come home, do my art assignments, but still get to play and just stay loose on the, you know, with the drums. Gotcha. And then how far did, you, did the animation go? Or the illustration? That was, uh, the animation came decades later, but, um, so I left the art school, got into a job in St. Paul, Minnesota as an illustrator, mm -hmm. but here we go, Vietnam, mm -hmm. very low lottery number, they're giving out numbers, I had number 16, so, oh, wow. okay, what am, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Audition for the Navy, mm -hmm. back in Chicago, funny thing, got into the Navy uh, band system. So I was good enough. And so this is all like after boot camp and everything or? Yeah, okay. had to do had to do boot camp, mm -hmm. but I auditioned before. Okay. I That's got nice. down to Great Lakes outside Chicago, uh -huh. auditioned with their big band, good enough. My reading was just good enough. Okay. My big band playing was sort of underdeveloped because I never got to play with a big jazz band. Okay. So, um, okay, so you auditioned on drum set. Yes. Not, ju not just doing snare no, or back no. or whatever. On, okay. on drum set with some charts, you know, three and four page charts and with the full band, which was totally exhilarating. Mm -hmm. Never done that before. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So, so then you, you were, what, four years, I think I read? Almost four years. Okay. Yep. And yep. then after that, you got out early 70s yeah and so then what so then got back uh started to get interested in trying to get in studio a studio situation mm -hmm. in minneapolis st paul mm -hmm. uh this is where we get the bob dylan thing sort of started mm -hmm. uh bob's brother dave and i we had a little trio up in uh northern minnesota Okay. He knew I was out of the and Navy. What town was this again? This is Hibbing. Hibbing, okay. Hibbing, Minnesota. Uh -huh. So Dave called me to do a couple sessions with people he was producing, uh, and that was the start of the recording thing back in maybe 71. And then finally, I got in a couple local bands, kind of fusion bands, because the fusion thing was getting big. Chick uh -huh. Corea, Mahavishnu yeah. Orchestra, those guys, Weather yeah. Report, you know. Uh, so... <clears throat> the bands were really fusion-y, and I knew a bass player uh -huh. uh, that said they were losing their drummer, you want to come and play, so I got in this fusion band, and from there, he, uh, he called me again and said, you know, the drummer, the, the guy who's been doing sessions is kind of tired of doing sessions, you want to do, you know, Northwest Orient Airlines is coming up, or Dairy Queen, or, you know, some big national uh, accounts, I got to play on those, which was scary but it was like the next step for me to to do session work well it was more like commercial type work. yeah absolutely and it was scary in what way scary because i remember one particular session they had a 35 piece orchestra in wow. <laughs> in in the aced a room 
at a studio called Sound 80 in Minneapolis. And that's also where Blood on the Tracks was recorded, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's daunting. But you had had some big band experience coming from the military I at that point. I did. I did. I got a lot of reading done. We do everything from concerts, nice concerts, then maybe an officer's club gig where you're playing old Glenn Miller stuff uh -huh. and old like swing, swing stuff. Sure. So I was getting to be a better reader mm -hmm. uh, and then combo stuff. And I put some bands together while in the Navy, James Brown style bands, good R&B, yeah. really fun funky, just, you know, two horns, three horns. Yeah, I was always trying to do that while I did my assignments during the days. Even the horns are percussion instruments in those kind of bands. Absolutely, right? absolutely. That's, yep. that's stuff I love. Yep. I might tell you my James Brown story later on. Oh, I want to hear it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, but first, before we get too far off, I want to I want to get back in, in like uh, your uh, formal training because it sounds like I don't know. Um, did you do formal training? during school and when you were younger? Formal in the sense, a band director okay. that was the guy that was made. No private was lessons. No, no private lessons. Uh -huh. Until er, the early days of, of my Navy career, I went to the Armed Forces School of Music. Okay. So there you had some good teachers. The so guy I wanted to get, I didn't get. I got a rudimentary guy, which was, was probably good for my chops too, building my rudimental chops. Yeah. So... But it was all set for you. It you was, learned on the set that, I, you built, yeah. that you built when you were a kid. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like parents were very supportive with all of it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ab what we heard today talking earlier about the young ladies that just it wasn't an instrument for them. Right. They didn't get to play. So right. that was the opposite for me. Right. They supported it. In fact, they said, uh, shouldn't you be down on that kit downstairs wow. in the basement for the... So there was a bit of a push, uh -huh. which was also good for me to just really keep yeah. mo moving along. There, yeah, we were talking a little bit about it before I hit record, but mm -hmm. my kids are playing drums and bass and piano right now. And just that balance of trying not to push too hard, you know, but like, you know, finding where, okay, where's the interest? The interest is here. Okay, and then encouragement, reminders. Shouldn't you be practicing yeah. right now? <laughs> right. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, yep. I love that because right now, so I've been taking some, some lessons again and some coaching and everything. And I, you know, I started off learning more like percussion first, but quickly went to the kit. Um, but then, you know, I know that there's a lot of talk these days or different approaches. I don't know if there's a lot of talk, but different approaches by drummers and, and drum teachers on getting those rudiments, getting the basics, doing these other instruments, and then getting on the kit. Mm -hmm. um, but yours was very much integrated the whole time. And I can um, talk about my parents being uh, very, what, what's a good word to use, very much uh, real world in the sense that they didn't say, oh, you're the greatest thing ever. And a, and a lot of kids get that nowadays, you know, yeah. just you're wonderful. You're great. You're just fabulous. Not that you don't need that support, but I got the support that says you're good. If you work at this, you're going to really, you know, there was that that climb that was built into whatever they said. Yeah. That, uh, hey, you're doing fine, but you're going to have to really keep going with this. you got to work hard, you know. Oh, that is so great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a... Uh, I've been reading this book called Mindset. Carol Dweck is this PhD researcher, and she's been researching uh, growth mindset mm -hmm. and really bringing attention to the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And uh, I've, I've just, yeah, I've fi like just almost done with the book, but basically your parents' natural inclination on understanding that, maybe more of a B.F. Skinner perspective, just mm -hmm. to like drop, you know, the psychologist mm -hmm. of the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, really talked more about, you know, is nature versus nurture, but also that Dweck brings up that the folks that get the praise, the status praise, oh, you're so great. Yeah, it gives the kid a boost in the moment, <laughs> but in the future, it really can undercut their success and their their progress because then if it becomes a part of their identity they have to protect that greatness and her mm -hmm. research showed that folks that get that are more likely to lie cheat 
not accept challenge and it does not help. And so, and it's so easy as parents to try to, you know, isn't praise good for your kids? Yeah, they crave it. Yeah. And they get a little boost for a little while, but you can change the way you praise much like it sounds like your parents did, like you, you're good, mm-hmm. but yeah, if you really want to have a go, yeah, not to put <laughs> words in their mouth, like you got a lot, you still have a lot of work to do. Like 98% yep. work, 2% talent. And the talent is questionable whether you need it or not, if you have the interest. Yeah, that's, that's well stated. And I can say a couple things happened to me going to art school in Chicago mm-hmm. and thinking I was pretty good, mm-hmm. uh, which that was supported by my parents. But getting into a school where there was some really wonderful drafts, men and drafts, women that mm-hmm. could draw anything. Yeah. And I, th- I said, that's not me. I plant man. Now I have to see where the next level might be. What does that look like? Me being able to do something like what they're doing yeah you know with the command of the pencil or the brush yeah and uh and then moving to la realizing that uh, one of the first bands i got in this is uh, mid-70s i was coming in with my minnesota kind of non-pocket i was pushing the beat real hard and that's a minnesota thing that's a minute that's a maybe a midwest thing and it's like an adrenaline thing too you're yeah. excited to play i'm sure you've had to look at that in your life so i get oh, in a I band yeah. i get in an la like a surf band uh but playing original stuff and i had more trouble with the, me and the bass player because he was always laying back where i felt like we were dragging uh-huh. no <laughs> he was right i was pushing too hard we keep looking at each other so i had some some big lessons to learn right and off this, the bat then this was after the military yes and how long were you in L.A. before you got the call to go help out Robert Zimmerman? Uh, this, I uh, moved to L.A. about 75. Just before I left, in s- end of 74 is when I got the call from Bob's management. So Cars packed, everything's ready to go. Can you make it to Sound 80 for, we'll say, one night? And I thought, okay, maybe a demo for Bob. Maybe he wants to just listen uh-huh. to some stuff. No, I was redoing parts of Blood on the Tracks, Uh which none of us knew right then. But the first night went so well, we went back and did it again. So we did five tunes, and then I was in my car going to L.A. right after that. Wow. Well, what's killing me right now is just this idea that you don't feel like you had much pocket before you went to L.A., and there's not much time because sure as hell, for that album, you found the pocket... And I was trying to, like, another thing, all right, I digress, but I'll, I'll come back to it. Yeah, go for it. I was thinking about style, right? Because, mm-hmm. I, I, like, I told you, like, my brother, like, he is an illustrator, uh, design, well, not an animator, but illustrator, mm-hmm. and went to art school, and I remember one piece of advice he gave at one point was, like, you know, your, it's your faults that end up becoming your style when you can hone them, you know? And so that is always stuck in my mind. And I'm not really completely sure I know what that means. I think I have an idea. But I was thinking about style, right? And then I saw another uh, uh, friend's podcast where they were talking about that same thing, where it's your limitations, whether they're physical or mental, that often end up becoming your style. And I was like, okay, so maybe if I'm looking for style, am I looking for limitations? And like I was listening to a lot of the different stuff that you've done, whether it was with uh, Flynn and the BBs or the Bob Dylan tracks or whatever, and they're different. They're also different, but I couldn't find any fault in what you were playing, you know, and I could be, and, and maybe what I came to was like, it feels like you're breathing. Like I can feel the crescendo and the decrescendo, like coming in and out of, of the music. And, and very much in the way that you're touching on the hi-hat snare, kind of doing the grace notes and everything else. Like I can feel this this pulse that's just nice and steady and it's coming through. But also, I it was clear to me too, now please correct this, but I mean, you were listening to Bob's voice. You were not following the bass player, even though that y'all were probably both doing the same thing, mm-hmm. but it was very much like mm-hmm. that was what was happening. In my mind, is that, how accurate is that? Uh, that's that's a first off of a very high compliment coming from another drummer, that you were feeling, sort of the breathing thing, and 
you can uh, that's akin to a sax player I yeah. mean he's got to take breaths places so my style has always sort of gone along with take a breath okay whether it's in a solo or in a pattern you're playing behind somebody there's got to be some humanity, some center to that, yeah. which creates the pocket, but also breathes air into it. And I love the word transparency nowadays. That's the playing is transparent. You can kind of hear the bass drum. Yeah. You can hear the hat. You can hear yeah. maybe a brush pattern or a stick pattern. And um, I've spent a lot of time analyzing different drummers from the start. Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, Joe Morello. Yeah. Next version, uh, Tony Williams, Jack DeJanet, yeah. Steve Gadd. You jump, okay, these yeah. generations and taking in the best parts of what those guys do, copying them for a while because it's so new, it's so good. Right. And then saying, okay, I can't listen to Steve anymore for a while now. I got to really okay. come back to what I do. Yeah. Then you bring up a good point of some of, the, some of your little idiosyncrasies on the kit become your style you know that kind of thing and it, not to compare you but like gad is who i thought of what, because i and maybe it was because i was listening to you know you know some of the some of the projects you've had have been like you had mentioned more in the realm of kind of not art rock but progressive or you yeah, know fusion, fusion maybe kind of stuff yeah and also i hear like the studio work so like i'm just hearing like all this placement and that's why i thought gad because he could, he could, he was a chameleon, or he is. Like he can just step into a situation, and he's a part of it, right? And so that's kind of what I was thinking about for you, but also like on some of that fusion stuff. Like there were real chops too. It wasn't, you know. And Gad's got chops, but Gad is also maybe not the choppiest of the players. But he always, it always feels good when you yes. hear him play. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> which I think is, you know. Like you can't really get better than that. But what's killing me still is that you don't feel like you really had pocket until maybe a year or two before you went to that. I think that was just a realization that the excitement of music, the adrenaline pumping through you and like the, the volume changes and, and taking a tune out, the shout chorus of a tune really getting big almost uh, supersedes the fact that where did that tempo go? Yeah. How much faster are we? I, to this day, I'll do that. I'll st I'll go to the end of a track I played, go back to the front and see how close the tempos were. Yeah. Uh, and if they're up a little bit, you know, that's that's that excitement and it's okay. Right. But you know, you can't be doing that with every tune. You know, you have to really find that place that feels good, and just dig into that. Was it like going from military? big band stuff to surf rock in California to then like really tuning into Bob Dylan's meter. Cause his is very unique, right? Like everyone has a unique voice in that way, but yep. his is particularly yep. unique. Yep. I mean, was that difficult? I think I was so, I mean, you, you put your headphones on and here's Bob Dylan mm -hmm. testing his voice and testing his guitar. And you realize the, the weight of that moment and you just come in and you are so focused on yeah. his guitar yeah. and it happened to be a number of uh, acoustic guitars, uh, e electric bass, organ, mm -hmm. eventually they did a little um, mandolin overdub on some yeah. of the stuff mm -hmm. but uh, just the fact that I felt I really I have to provide the, the core, the root to, uh, to his music yeah. And if he and I aren't locked in, along with the bass player um, <laughs> and everybody else in the rhythm section, uh, they don't have a track to right. go back to overdub if they want, right. you know. Uh, so you realize a drummer's job in the studio is that. You can move notes nowadays with Pro Tools and stuff. You can move a bass drum over, you know, yeah. a, a fraction of a second when needed or something. You can do a lot of stuff. but. The better the drummer is on the basic track, yeah. the more strength the song has. Yeah, you still need that raw cut, that yeah. raw source. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, so a lot of commercial stuff before that kind of prepared you for, you know, like large room situations or a lot of players, that kind of a situation where it's so important to get the drums right yeah. as soon as you can. Yeah. 
to them being able to to play with someone like Bob Dylan. And it sounds like for what like was not really part of the plan initially was to rework those songs. But then after a couple of tracks, it was like, yeah, OK, let's yeah. do all of this. OK. And with somebody like Bob, he does not like to track a lot. Yeah. Once or twice, maybe three times. Right. That's it. You got the final track. So you better be pretty close every take that you do. <laughs> that yeah. you do. Yep. I, and I've only heard this. I don't have any studio. I mean, I've got like some small studio experience, but um, but the idea is too like there can be so many tracks and 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 at the end of the day, they probably go with like the first take or the second take. Anyway, you know what? Right? Even with a few little fluffs in there, the spirit is there. Everybody right. knows the energy is there. I'll say too something you you yourself could play with. I don't know if you play with a click very often. Yeah, that's not as often as I should, but yeah. And that's a good thing because I just I did a session two weeks ago, where the band was just like a pull together band. Uh, everybody was good, but we'd never all worked together, mm -hmm. and we decided some of the tempos were really slow, like sixty BPM. Oh wow, that's that. Dang. You know, down there, okay. and it's got to be accurate. So we decided to go with a click, and everybody said they pointed to me because I'd work with click more than anybody else. Uh -huh. So they didn't want to hear it, but they fed the click to me. Right. And then I stayed with it, and everybody sort of said, "Okay, we're going to listen to Bill even more now." Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 It is helpful. Every time I do it, I know I, I come out better with yeah. it. And there was a lot of metronome practice when I was a kid. Sure. Which is probably why I started pulling away from it. <laughs> but now there's like, I don't think we were doing it at that time, but this micro time, yes. you know, where you start a little off and then you can make the metronome sound more musical. It's yes. fascinating. Yes. So I've been trying yeah. to work on that kind of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so you had mentioned some idiosyncrasies. Yes. Like, what do you find if you've looked back at yourself or... I'm sort of a non-pattern player. I get real bored with the same pattern f through the whole song. And that doesn't mean the verse sounds like this, the chorus sounds like that with a different pattern. But within a verse, uh -huh. within a chorus, yeah. I was going to bring this up. I call it the moving backbeat, the moving two and four. So okay. instead of... How about... So I'm moving one of the two backbeats yeah. somewhere else yeah. to make it a little more interesting. Hopefully it works with the, what the guitar player is doing and the bass player is doing yeah. and the keyboard guy but um, or girl. Uh, but it's like being open enough to say, you know what, I'm just not going to just fall into the two and four yeah. right away. I'm going yeah. to think of something else maybe. Yeah, that's the challenge. Yeah. And so I've heard that called like a big pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess where like you still you're still in the pocket, yeah. but you're like pushing the limits of where that can actually be, yeah. and still making it sound good and still reliable enough for your other players, right? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and that, yeah. Did you feel like that's always been the case for you? Like that's been kind of your thing? I think so. Maybe back in the early rock days where it was Buddy Holly and mm -hmm. um, and the Everly Brothers, and that is really pretty simple playing, good right. playing, but very understandable. Yeah. And you can't argue with two and four feels great. I mean, that's where you start. People feel good. It's a walking meter, you know, mm -hmm. with the backbeat. It just feels good. So uh, nothing against that. I just like to see if I can make a little innovation in there, just a little something different. Do you feel like it was always something to explore for you? Or do you feel like it was a limitation in the fact that you were getting frustrated and like really trying hard to try to make sure it's right on point? It's a narrow pocket. You're trying to hit it just so. And just finding that that's just not where you were going. Uh, I think the frustration was part of it that uh, you put on anything. You hear just about anything on the radio. It's always two and four. Right. The big country rock music nowadays is big, fat, you know, backbeats, and uh, that's good. It works. I just wanted to be a little bit more unique, if yeah. possible. Yeah. And uh, I love the idea, actually, of linear playing, so yeah. nothing hits at the same time. Yeah. And that really opens the door to, I usually throw a cowbell up on my, my bass drum. I might do a wood block somewhere yeah. or another little, a little sound uh, source just to sort of 
you know, make the dynamic within each me measure a little different, something different. Were all those other instruments kind of what they would call auxiliary percussion instruments always a part of your interest, or like when did you start exploring those? Uh, not always. Uh -huh. Cowbell kind of came in first because of the Latin stuff you play, cha-chas and tangos and that kind of stuff. You get you, That's a, a needed part, I think. And then finally, put, putting shakers in and playing left-handed cross stick mm -hmm. or stick click, different terms for that, but a shaker in the right hand. And you see that a lot more nowadays, sort of drummers incorporating sounds and not always hi-hat cross stick kick, yeah. but a little bit more than that, Yeah. just for variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So 70s, doing some recording work, it sounds like. And how long were you in California? I uh, actually moved there in about 76. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of struggled for a few years, although another band I'm very proud of uh, have been in, uh, the Wayne Johnson Trio. Uh -huh. Wayne is a marvelous guitar player, yeah. a Grammy winner, actually. Yeah. Uh, and we had a trio with Jimmy Johnson, who was Flim uh -huh. of Flim and the BB, so... Jimmy and I had, uh, I'll say, I had the, the enormous pleasure of working with him in two bands at the same time. And Wayne, uh, I, uh, and just you know, being frank too, like I was not familiar until I started doing a little bit of a dive on some of your history. Uh huh. But and I was so like, this is part of what I love about this podcast too, is because you can't know everything, but so many things are available and so i was just glad to be able to find some recordings of that stuff me too but wayne uh is like you i would say in that it's not like there's some exploration you know like there's a bit of a dance to it and it's not always just back and forth you know so it seems like it's well matched it's um you're hitting on a great point it's that musical conversation that starts with um, uh, another great drummer, Jeff Hamilton. I read an ar article uh, in Modern Drummer with him, and it's the truth. We start with silence before we do anything. So how do we move from nothing to something? Mm -hmm. I did a master class at Brevard College maybe eight or ten years ago mm -hmm. with two combos sitting there. One combo would start a song, stop, another combo would start, both combos, I stopped both of them even before the end of the intro, and I said, you guys play half as much as you just played. Okay. You know, everybody started in with 16th notes on the hat, and bass player was busy, piano player was real busy. Where do you go? Yeah. Where do you go from there? So I stopped both bands, and they realized that you don't have to do all kinds of stuff right off the bat. You can right. just let the, the song unfold and move, you know, and go into the first verse and the chorus and wherever it's going. So playing less is uh, going to give you some a, a place to go. Absolutely. Yep. I I often put Instagram in the in the crosshairs, you know, as far as like the drumming world's concerned. But like, so you know, you get these short clips that you can provide, and so yes. many times it's like. Show all your chops all at once. Yeah, that's right. And that's so right. it's just interesting yeah. to think about the number of new musicians that are picking that up and that's what they're consuming. And so it's like that's kind of what there is. Yeah. And it's not a complete idea. And it's, I mean, it, they're out there, but trying to find yeah. a song that's longer than three minutes, uh, let alone, but then, you know, trying to include some dynamic and then some key changes and maybe, maybe a rhythmic change and not just laying down the 16ths or doing these sextuplets like fills and everything else, right? And I'm a, I'm a sucker for virtuosity. I love Dave Weckl and Vinny and you name it. There's so many. Virgil Donati and I know about all those guys. I watch them play and then I'm it's a funny thing. I'll do a bunch of YouTube things and I'll go back to Steve Gadd and the band Stuff. Because mm -hmm. it just totally groove. Yeah proper appropriate fills from yeah. everybody so i love both sides of it but for me i like to kind of go back and settle down into let's find that where it feels good yeah and then build a song from there and that's that's kind of where i've been finding myself again like kind of going back to james brown you know stubble field like where you have this pocket but there's so much interest within the pocket and so much build that it just feels good and then there's a lot of great 
bands like that now today too sure. that are sure. that are doing similar stuff and a lot of organ trios that have been cashing on too and so that's kind of what i've what i've been kind of falling back to myself is like you know i think the pocket is where i want to be sure you know sure so do you still do much with brevard I play Please. in and around Brevard. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a number of different admin administrations come into the college, so I know a bass player that works there, not in the music department, mm -hmm. uh, and he used to say, hey, uh, the drummer's missing from the rehearsal. Can you come in and play with this, these kids? Absolutely, I nice. am there. Whatever I can share and help them grow mm -hmm. and be supportive as an older player. Yeah. And I've played with the other kinds of band directors uh, brought forth by, what was it, Whiplash, the movie? Oh, right. Yeah. Which drove me crazy. I, I, I just said, that's not music for me. That's not. So I've had those adult guys that were older than me that happened to be band leaders that were not supportive. They were only they were mad at you if you missed something, you know. So yeah. uh, what I tried to do with, in that circumstance with young players that just a lot of them hadn't even played in a big band yet and here they're right. at Brevard College are good readers they're not soloists yet but they're section players right but to um, sort of support them and say okay let's take it a little slower from letter A one that's slower let's hear all the notes and hear how they match up with everybody else with the rhythm section with all three horn sections bones reeds and trumpets and you know everybody mm -hmm. so um, those things I kind of, I, I, it's a magnet for me. I, I like to be involved in that, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of kid instruction, college thing. I don't do a lot of it, but I'm always open to it. Nice, nice, yeah. And Brevard, I mean, they've, they've had a reputation of being a good music school yep. in the area. Yep. I got to see you once at, uh, with, uh, is it Jason Cristofero? Yeah. And who was your bass player? That's Cameron Austin, who uh -huh. is the guy that teaches another program at Brevard College. So we get to play together. There's an interesting guy, an acoustic electric bass. Right. So a different, a different animal altogether. So that's the fun of music, too. Yeah. You'll get the upright guys I get to play with. You get the E guys, uh -huh. E bass guys, four string, five string. Right. Uh, or somebody like Cameron, you know, so... Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you know, I kind of came into this project because I had my own blocks and found a lot of success in talking to other drummers uh, and, and, and an ability to break through those blocks. Blocks keep coming, though, right? Yes. And so no doubt throughout your career you've seen them, and it sounds like you've navigated them in several ways. Are you finding any specific blocks these days, whether it's technical or, or something else as far as art? Uh, the pandemic has given me a chance to dig into my playing mm -hmm. and just do an overall assessment of where I am in this long career of mine. Right. Um, I've picked up the clave thing a lot more okay. between the feet. Yeah. You know, getting that set up and then being very free to play on top of that. Yeah. Very difficult. Takes a total amount of patience. Yeah. And realizing I am not anywhere near where I can bring this out into my playing uh, at gigs. Okay. And being patient enough to say it's a work in progress. It just uh, it's just going to take a long time. Yeah. And I don't mind that. And I'm much more patient with myself. Yeah. So blocks like that I've negotiated because uh, like Horacio Hernandez, uh, uh -huh. El Negro, uh -huh. uh, wonderful him and Antonio Sanchez is another oh, yeah. plays with uh, Matheny. Yeah, he's a great piano player too. Just to let you know, Antonio that. is. Yeah, I knew he's composing his own. Yeah, uh, records and stuff. I just got a chance to see him at Big Ears last. Uh, I guess that was last spring, and I didn't know. I was not informed, uninitiated, and blown away. Oh, with his playing. <laughs> oh my gosh! What a player! What good hands! What right? and so musical. And providing texture and not just rhythm, but like, yeah, I was blown away. I love guys like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Blade is another yeah. guy, you know. Yeah. Um, and those guys have come around, especially Brian, is much more sonic than he is technique, although he can still blow you away with technique. Uh -huh. But he chooses the colors sometimes over the rhythmic prowess. Right. And um, 
uh, Julian Lodge, the guitar player, wonderful guitar player, uses um, Dave King from the oh, Bad yeah, Plus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, that's another thing, to listen to sonic and openness, you know, and not always full of pattern, full of rhythmic things, right. you know. So um, we're coming in, and the use of percussion around the set, you yeah. know. Um, Jeff Ballard with, um, who is he with now? I'm, I'm blanking on names, uh, the piano player. Uh, another guy that brings in, like, third world drums yeah. and uh, lots of shakers and things just to in the spur of the moment, picking up a shaker or a tambourine, and that's the rhythm, maybe with kick and hat, mm -hmm. but that is appropriate for that moment, and it's spontaneous. So I love those kind of drummers, too, the spontaneous guys. Yeah, 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 absolutely. What about uh, projects coming up or gigs coming up? Anything? It's funny, the band that I've been working with in Brevard, a, a, a vocal uh, quartet, has since uh, not booked the room any longer, uh, there's a few things coming up, but it's like me going back in my world of, okay, what's the best thing for me? Who do I talk to? Who do I text to? And sort of, you know, uh, putting the wagons in a circle mm -hmm. and then moving out from that, just saying, okay, what kind of music do I want to play? Yeah. Do I want to be everybody's session player mm -hmm. or do I keep that going? but have my original project. So that's that's being floated right now. It's kind of in, in um, sort of an animated state that's not quite hit okay. the ground yet. So okay. so I'm working on stuff right now, okay. deciding on what's the best at my age, too. I'm in my 70s, so, uh -huh. you know, uh, I'm not a guy who's going to play four nights a week anywhere. You seem in really good shape. I'd say a lot of that I have to hand to my wife, Karen, uh -huh. who's also a, a brilliant artist and a wonderful companion uh -huh. and somebody very aware of what we're eating uh -huh. and <laughs> how much we're exercising and power walking. Yeah. And uh, I know from the past I used to get up and wait like 10 or 15 pounds above where I am. I didn't play as well. I had There was this room, uh, additional room between me and the snare drum, Yeah, you know, that little gut thing. Yeah, and, and you I, can sit in your stool differently. Yes. Like it affects everything. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Believe me, I know. You, you, <laughs> you know. So it's for me, it's a matter of good, healthy eating, good habits. And the biggest challenge nowadays is just the world around us and the climate and the political yeah. wranglings and so many things. So I feel music for all of us is a real break from that because... When you're playing, you know that's what you're doing. You're not thinking about much else. Right. I'm never as focused as when I'm playing. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. whatever it is. How much do you play a day, I think? I try to get, if I can get a half hour in a day, yeah. and surprising when you, you've retired, which I'm sort of using that as a uh, maybe a substitute word. I think I'm busier than I was when I was uh, working in uh, the film in industry out in L.A. Okay. Uh, but there's a lot of maintenance to do. There's food shopping. There's food prep. There's the laundry. There's, you know, sure. all that stuff goes in. You know about that with two daughters. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that takes you away from that committed practice every day. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah absolutely. So I do my best. But yeah. uh, And even uh, I just bought one of the pads that, that sits on your knee with a yeah. little strap under it. Yeah. Steve Smith has, has one of those uh -huh. he uses on the road. Uh, and I find that, and I just throw it on there, and I get 15 minutes of paradiddles and, yeah. you know, and flam of whatevers and, uh -huh. you know, all that stuff. Sure. <laughs> so I try to keep a, over a span of a week, try to get two or three hours in if I can uh -huh. or more. Yeah, that, and that was one thing. So I've, I've, um, I've talked to River Gregorian, who I think you probably have met at some point. Yes, yes, in I have. Because you moved here a while ago, right? Back in 04. Yeah, okay. But going back and forth to California for, uh -huh. for music, for family. Yeah. And then we said in 2011, let's make one home the priority. Yeah. So this is our base Got it. of operations. But yeah, River was telling me, I took a lesson, or I took a few lessons from him. He's just like, you know, you don't have to be at the kit to practice, you know. Like if you're working out these, these, uh, this limb independent stuff, uh, and these different ostinatos, like you can sit there and do it quietly, and no one would even know. You are right. You know, you bring a set with you because you got your feet and right. you got your lap. Maybe one or two stories that I'll tell right now. But what uh, I saw that you had a project going with Jeff Sight for a little while. 
who also lives in Brevard. He does. How did that come about? And I think we've talked about it. Uh, where we got together originally was at the old Phoenix downtown mm -hmm. Brevard. Okay. Monday nights, Jeff and I would set up alongside each other and invite different people from Steep Canyon Rangers to friends he knew to people I knew, mm -hmm. and we'd just jam. And we took it so far th that club closed. We played together at his house a few times, mm -hmm. which is always total inspiration for me because we're real different drummers, but yeah. we respect each other for what we do. Mm -hmm. Each of us does. That is something I need to redo because uh, COVID got in the way for, for a long time. Yeah. And uh, he and I need to talk because we inspire each other to have a drummer that good in the same town that you live yeah, it's, it's like almost like mini L.A. Because yeah, right. everybody in L.A. from Vinny to Weckl to everybody, you know, they're they're out there, too. So. Right. But it's it's um, sort of my check in to how I'm playing when I when I sit down and Jeff and I play together. Yeah. 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 Had you played with other drummers like that? Any other bands? Where, like, uh, that's pretty much unique. Mm -hmm. Um can't think of another time other than some good percussionists. I got to do a, a date with Luis Conte, uh -huh. one of the Flim and the BBC CDs. Okay. Jimmy Flim invited Luis to come and play. That was, we just did, I think, one samba with him, but just, you can float on his time. Yeah. I mean, it's so strong. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I'd actually met you very briefly. There's no reason you would ever remember it, but I remember I was working valet at the Inland Biltmore Estate, I think maybe around the time that you had just moved here. And so I, and uh, you were coming up and someone told me, he's like, oh, that's, well, you, of course they said, that's Bob Dylan's drummer. Yeah. You know, I was uh. like, what? <laughs> no way. And then you were just so nice, which was all, I mean, and I would say the majority of people we ran into are nice, but uh, at the same time, sometimes you don't always know what you're going to get, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really cool to meet you and, and, and chat a little bit just about the drumming and stuff like that. that was, you that know, I vaguely remember that because we didn't, didn't get we don't go there that often. But uh -huh. um, one of my jobs in life is to encourage people to get their drums out of storage right. or their violin out or whatever it is. Yeah, that's my job. Yeah. And uh, just knowing that you were associated, you were associated with music in some way. Yeah. It, it kind of lights me up. I'm like a kid nice. that says, hey, here's a, I could I can talk to you for a minute or two while we go in. My wife gets mad at me sometimes because I'll say you can, you know, whether it's art, somebody comes up, we're painting outdoors and says, you know, I used to do that back in high school. Yeah. You can go buy a set of paints tomorrow right. in right. an easel and some brushes and go right out there and relive and feel the joy of, of doing that. So, yeah. so I'm a yeah. conduit for that. I have to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Always a reminder. Like art is there. It's, it's for you, you know? Yes. You yes. don't have to, you don't have to have this skill level that you might think, or we might think that we need yes. in order to do it, you know? Yes. Awesome. Yep. Well, thanks so much. I feel like at this point, maybe do you would you like to play a little bit? I could play a little bit, sure. That'd be amazing. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 